stuff. I'm putting all the staff data into new files, and I notice that I don't have files for two people. I think you might have them. Oh, really? What are their names? Peter Austin and Jane Moore. Let me have a look. Yes, I've got them here. Shall I send them to you? No, you don't need to. Just give me the information now. I can write it on some new files. I don't really need the photos if you've got photos there. OK. Well, Peter Austin first. Now, is that Austin with an I or Austin with an E? It's A U S T I N, and his address is 110 Argyle Street, Tunbridge Wells, Kent, T N 3 5R Q. 110? Uh huh. And his phone number? It's 07984 645 792. OK. And how old is he? He's 47. 47? And what about his marital status? He's married. There's a note here that he has three children, two boys and a girl. OK. And finally, when did he join the company? He started with ESCO in August 2003. Thanks, Maggie. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, what about Jane? Her name's Jane Moore, that's M-O-O-R-E, and her address is 72 Cedar Road, Crowborough, Kent, CR3 5RQ. CR3 and what, sorry? CR3 5RQ. And how do you spell Cedar? C-E-D-A-R. Her phone number is 07984 650 396. 07984 650 396. Yes. Now, she's 22 and she's single. OK. And she started with ESCO in 2005, February 2005. Right. Thanks, Maggie. That's very helpful. <laughs> Goodbye now. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Who's next, please? I think I am. How can I help you? I just came in on flight 372 from Singapore at 11.30 and my luggage hasn't arrived. I've been waiting at the baggage claim for about half an hour now and everything seems to have come off the plane. The conveyor belt has stopped and all the passengers have gone. So I came here to find out what has happened to my bag. Can I see your ticket, please? Here it is. So you came from Hong Kong today and changed planes in Singapore, right? Yes. The connection in Singapore was a tight one. The plane got in late and I had to rush to get to the next flight. That's the problem right there. There wasn't enough time to get your bags onto the connecting flight. Normally Singapore Airport is very efficient. 
Now, I need you to fill in these forms. Your name? Jenny Lee. Address? I guess you want my address here. I'm staying with relatives. Just a minute, I'll have to look it up. It looks like 583. No, it's 533 East 67th Street in Riverside. Do you have the phone number there? Yes, I do. It's um, 9301 4269. So you came in on Qantas Flight 392. Do you know the number of the flight out of Hong Kong? Let me see. I think it was Cathay Pacific 900 or something. Oh, yes. It says here, CX912. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Right. Now, I need a description of the luggage. How many pieces did you check in? Just one. Can you describe it for me? Here is a picture to help you. OK. It's a big bag, like this one. Rectangular. Not hard shell, but soft covered, and it has a zipper around the front. Is it black? No, sort of a grey colour. Any identification? Just a tag with my name on it. Any other features? Well, it has wheels and a retractable handle on the end, so you can pull it, as well as the handle in the middle. OK, that's fine. Now, if your bag missed the connection, I'm sure it'll be put on the next flight. I'll email Singapore as soon as I finish here. The next flight comes in at 17.50. That's 10 to 6 this evening. You can pick it up then. 10 to 6? That's too long to wait. Can I get my uncle to pick up the bag on his way home from work? Sorry, you have to be here yourself to clear customs. Of course, I almost forgot. Will the bag come here, to this desk? Yes. You pick it up here, then take it over to the customs area. By the way, don't forget to bring your passport. You will also need to have the key plus your ticket with a baggage claim number on it. Oh, OK. Guess I'll have to come back tomorrow then. It's lucky I packed everything I need for now in my carry-on bag. Yes, that's always a good idea. Be prepared. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a business study student called Sam talking to his tutor about an IT project he is going to do for a local company called Turner's. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Sam. Come in and sit down. Thanks. You're here to discuss your company-based IT project, aren't you? Yes. I've been to see the manager and he's given me a lot of ideas about projects that the company would find useful. But I wanted to ask your opinion about them before I choose one. Yes, that's fine. Now, this company's called Turner's, isn't it? That's right. It's a small engineering company. They make machine components for trade use. They're well established. They started in 1976, but they're a bit old fashioned. OK. And what kind of projects did Turner's suggest you could do for the company? Well, they want some improvements made to their customer database. Uh, the one that they've got at the moment isn't very useful in some ways. I had a quick look at it. Uh, mm. That would be a very straightforward project, and it'd be simple enough to evaluate, but I don't think you'd get enough out of a project like that. You wouldn't learn anything new. Well, another project they suggested is to do with their online sales catalogue. At the moment, customers can look at their products, but they can't actually order them online, which must affect their competitiveness. But I said I thought it would take too long. It's quite a big task. You're right. It's too much for the time you've got. It's a pity, though. Then they want some help with their payroll system. At the moment, the way they calculate pay involves a lot of manual accounting. I suggested they could have a system where employees register electronically when they arrive and leave work, so the hours they do could be transferred automatically. Hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of a project like that. It would extend your skills, but it wouldn't be too much to take on. A student did something similar a couple of years ago, but this is slightly different. Hmm. Well, then they need help with their stock inventory. They do everything manually. Really? <laughs> yes, and it takes so much time. Ugh. It's probably very inaccurate, too. An electronic inventory would probably be the biggest single benefit for the company. I'm surprised they haven't had it done before. I know. Then they wanted to improve their internal security. The manager had visited other companies where the staff use uh, swipe cards to access various areas of the building. It sounded useful, but the trouble is I'm not really sure how to do it. Well, I think you're right in that assessment. At the moment, it's probably a bit beyond your level of knowledge. Is that all? Just one more. Customer service. They want to be able to collect feedback from their customers in a more systematic way. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess, and they probably lose business as a result. Would that involve you going to see customers at their own premises? Because in that case, you might have to do a fair amount of traveling, and that would incur expenses that haven't been agreed with these companies. I never thought of that. Well, it might not be a problem, but it's something that needs clarifying. Well, I hope that's been helpful in narrowing down the options. Yes, it has. Thanks. I'll be able to make a decision now. But while I'm here, can I talk to you about coursework? Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm not very happy about the way our group assignment is working. There are some problems. Oh dear. Are people just not getting on with each other? That's the worst thing. Actually, we're all friends. It's not that. But when we're having a discussion about the assignment, one or two people end up doing all the talking and the rest don't say anything. It's... A bit frustrating because we need plenty of debate. Well, that's a common observation. You're studying in a group with people from all over the world and you all have your own ways of participating. In some places, students are more used to listening than talking and vice versa. Mm, I suppose you're right. I'll try to remember that. Does everyone pull their weight as far as sharing the workload is concerned? I'd say they do, yes. And... Our group elected uh, a leader. She's very good at making sure no one's overloaded. But personally, I feel that there are just too many of us in the group. 
Whenever we try to arrange a meeting, there's always at least one person who can't make it. It's not anyone's fault, it's just that we've all got slightly different timetables. Well, I'm glad you've talked to me about it. Feedback is always useful. Is there anything else you're concerned about? Uh, there are a couple of problems with lecturers that, that all the students are talking about. Hmm. Last semester we had negative feedback about the way lectures were organized. There were several occasions when the wrong room had been booked or the same room had been booked twice, that sort of thing. Is that still a problem? That hasn't happened at all as far as I know. Oh, good. It's sorted out then. But I don't know the reason, but... Some of the staff often turn up late, so we miss 10 or 15 minutes of our lecture time. It might be because they've been copying handouts for students. I think there's a queue for the machine sometimes. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you for telling me. Anything else? <laughs> the other thing is that it can be very difficult to get to see a lecturer individually. They're all very supportive and friendly when you do manage to find them, but often they're not in their office, even at times when they're meant to be available for consultation. Okay, that's helpful. Now, before you leave, uh, let me... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by Dr. Miranda James. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now, listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 35. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first in a series of talks we have arranged for the Overseas Students Association this semester. Dr. James has very kindly agreed to speak to us today on the topic of public speaking, and judging from the large numbers of you here, it's clearly a subject of great interest and relevance. Dr. James. Hello. It's good to see so many of you here, and hopefully what I'm going to tell you will be useful to you both here at the university and in your future employment. Many people avoid speaking publicly, by which I mean in front of, say, ten or more people. Not because they lack the ability but mainly because they lack confidence, which is really only due to lack of practice. Today, as a consequence of the influence of television, audiences expect speakers to be relatively brief and to the point, in addition to being well-informed and interesting or entertaining. Probably the most important part of public speaking is what you do beforehand, by which I mean preparation. This includes practical details, such as knowing precisely what your topic is and exactly how long you are expected to talk for. You should also plan the content thoroughly. A good strategy is to write out the content as you intend to say it, and then make brief notes, preferably on small cards, which you use to talk from. This way you sound more natural. You incorporate pauses while you look at your notes, and you can then look at your audience while you are speaking. Never read your speech without looking at the audience. 
Eye contact is a very important part of communicating with an audience. So deliberately move your head and look around at your audience. Pauses are important, as most people, when they are nervous, tend to rush through their speech. Now you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 36 to 40. Practice speaking slowly. This gives you more time to pronounce your words correctly. It's always easier for your audience to listen to someone whose speaking is clear and calmly paced so that they can understand the ideas being explained. And the bigger the group, the more slowly you should speak. Remember to project your voice, speaking clearly to the person furthest away from you. It's a good idea to rehearse and record yourself. Pay attention to your intonation when you listen to yourself. It's even harder if you're speaking in a second language, I would imagine but there's nothing worse than listening to a flat, monotonous voice. So try to vary your tone and rhythm.